Welcome everyone to EA Global Summit 2021. This is Sujat from EA Global Summit organizing team. It's our privilege to have David Hetherington in our presence, the head of research and development, over 10 years of experience as a manager and consultant, 15 years of experience in modeling safety critical system and enterprise architecture, over 20 years of ex experience in software and system architecture. Presenting SysML Quick Start using Enterprise Architect. And I also thank everyone for your interest in joining the session and for your kind information that we will be muting all the participants throughout the session. So please use the chat window to drop your questions to the speakers. Your queries will be answered at the end of the session. We request everyone to visit the All Outer Microsoft Team channel to communicate with David and the other EA practitioners after the session. David Aaron and the other EA speakers accepted to stay in the channel to have a one to one discussion and answer all your queries. The link to the MS team channel is posted in the chat window for your quick reference. If you have any difficulties in connecting to teams, please let us know through the chat window or write us at registration at global, eaglobalsummit.com. Thanks once again for your interest and support to EA Global Summit 2021. Without any further ado, I'll request David to start his presentation. Over to you, David. Yeah, good morning or good evening, depending on where in the world uh, you are. I happen to be in Austin, Texas, and it's a uh, good evening here. Um, and yeah, we're going to spend most of this uh, session. I'm going to in the tool. I'm, I've just this, this, I've got a few slides here or more where to get more information. I'm going to show you a couple things quickly, and then we're going to jump into the tool. And we're just going to construct a model, and I'm going to walk through that. And then at the end, I'll put this information back up one more time for anyone who comes late uh, to see where we can uh, get the, get this. And uh, the in the Teams here, we can see there's a channel for this session. And this little presentation, which we've got up on the screen right now, is available in the file section of that. If you're familiar with Teams, you can just go get the presentation. Like I said, it's not really the main content. The main content is this tutorial we're going to walk through, but that's downloadable as well, which I'm going to show you in a minute. So um, first, uh, SysML, one of the first things is, well, you've got to have the right edition of uh, Enterprise Architect. Uh, these three have it. Uh, this lowest end one does not. So if you'd like to do SysML, you need at least the corporate, uh, corporate edition uh, in, in order to do SysML. The, Unified and Ultimate editions uh, have more features like simulation. Um, however, you don't need them at the beginning level. If you're just going to do the beginning, uh, the beginner's book, which um, I, I have, or this tutorial, all you need is the corporate edition. Uh, for downloading this, uh, the tutorial itself, this is uh, this tutorial that you're going to do is actually just chapter two of the book, SysML for Beginners Using Sparks Enterprise Architect from Asate Press. And when you go to the website here, uh, asatepress.com, you go to downloads and tutorials, and you can pull down the, the book uh, or this tutorial, as well as some installation notes and uh, sample models. Now, I can talk a whole hour about SysML. SysML is a system modeling language um, it's uh, developed by ANCOSI, the International Council on Systems Engineering, and uh, together with OMG, who serves as the standard body. Uh, the big thing uh, I want to get to, though, before we start, if people are really unfamiliar with SysML, is SysML is not a PowerPoint compiler. Uh, so this is an example from my book about the little company that's trying to make a pay-as-you-drive uh, uh, pay-as-you-drive insurance box that would mount under the dashboard of a car. And because it's high volume, it probably has uh, a custom design chip. Uh, of course, it has a housing. Uh, it's got some embedded software, a board. Uh, there's marketing. There, it's going to need a cloud interface for customers. So there's, there's, there's a cloud application. Well, and there's a web interface. And even data privacy laws might affect it. You know, uh, what about your driving data? Can anyone see that? Ethics. What if the car is speeding right near an elementary school? Should you call the police or not, right? So there's an ethics and so on. And the, the, the thing about these is the purpose of SysML is to form a the minimal, clear understanding that all of these different stakeholders uh, can, can go back and uh, use their, their tools. Because every single one of these stakeholders has some specialized tools. 
mechanical engineer has a CAD system, accountant has accounting tools, lawyer has databases, and SysML does not replace those tools, and you don't, and, and it's not the intent of the systems engineer to do these people's job. It's only to sort of facilitate the common understanding is really the, what we're trying to do. Uh, here's the book. I'll put this back up. Uh, you can get the whole book if you want it. And uh, this is questions. And I'll put this up at the end again so we can take a look at it. Okay, so with, uh, with that uh, out of the way, uh, now we're going to make a model. And uh, I'm going to go a little slow. So maybe uh, for this, this session, maybe someone has uh, never even seen Enterprise Architect. So this is Enterprise Architect 15.2. And it comes up. I've got the perspective set to SysML down here in the low, uh, in the uh, in the lower right-hand corner. If it's not set that way, you can set it up here by managing perspectives and and and, and selecting it and selecting what you want. Um, and uh, we've got a start page. I usually don't use that, so I stop that here. We're going to make a little doorbell system. So um, with it, you know, with it, this started. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is uh, create a doorbell system. So we're going to do just like any other thing. You make a new project here. And um, here we're going to do this. And we're just going to call it doorbell. And it, because the SysML perspective is uh, set down here, this devolves to being a SysML, uh, SysML model. It's good practice to... Uh, Rename your model. You don't have to. A model will work without it. But your your SysML model is all about communicating with humans. It's again, it's not something you try to compile. So you want the model to be as easy for people to understand as possible. So it's good. You you want to first of things first. You want to name the model so that people can understand what kind of model they're looking at. Now, we can just start putting elements into the model, but it's a really bad idea, and no modeler does that. You instead organize the model in packages. And packages are just very much like uh, directories in your Windows file system. You can think of them as a little file system within the model. And, uh, and you, uh, you make a hierarchy of packages so that you yourself and later other people will be able to find what they're looking for in the model when, when, they're, uh, when they come to look at it. So the first thing here is we're going to start off and define some hardware. So we're going to add a package. And we're going to call this hardware. My uh, tutorial doesn't have this, but I'm collaborating with several consultants. And one of them from, from Germany pointed out that this is really a nice practice to actually identify this. Otherwise, this model can get very quick, quickly get hard to um, to uh, understand. So I've now taken in the last uh, year, I, I picked up his his pack, a practice of naming packages PKG at the end. So you can see that you're looking at a package. Yes, there's an icon there, but it's, it, that icon isn't the most visible thing in the world. Uh, so, uh, so now we know that that's a package. So we've got a package there. And, uh, and uh, we're going to there's several different ways to do things. We're going to do it by just making a diagram right away. And uh, we're going to, the SysML has nine different diagrams. We're going to use one of them uh, called the block definition diagram. And we're going to make the doorbell system context. Now, You'll notice that this says block definition diagram. If you're not familiar with SysML, you might think, aha, the block diagrams I've always been drawing as a hardware engineer. It, this is not really what a block definition diagram is. The uh, block definition diagram is more like the uh, bill of materials diagram. It lays out the relationship of types of things and how, how the types of things are structured in terms of uh, relationship to each other. So here you notice we've I've, uh, named the block definition diagram doorbell system context. This is uh, one of the first things you make is a context diagram where you want to describe both your system, not all its details, but at least the system and probably the couple top level uh, subsystems. And then you want to describe the things around the system as well. So we're going to use here the block 
And a block in, uh, in uh, SysML can be anything. We can think of it as thing, or actually more specifically, kind of thing. And, uh, and it, yes, it can be a piece of hardware, or it can be a system, it can be software, it can be a political party, it can be anything, a recipe for cooking uh, donuts. Uh, a block can be anything you want, and SysML is completely flexible. It's not built around any one kind of design. So here we're going to define the doorbell system. All right, so there's our system. That's the system we have. And the system has two com major components. We're going to have the, uh, the, uh, the button. Whoops, just make sure I'm doing this consistently with my own, uh, my own. Oh yes, doorbell button unit is what I've been calling that. There's a button and there's a chime. Now, obviously there needs to be a relationship here between these two things, and SysML provides for a number of kinds of relationships. And the one we're gonna use, this is the one the most used for the structure, is what's called a part association. And we draw that from here to here, and you'll notice the word part appears. We got a little, little uh, compartment that says we've now got these parts, and we now have said that the doorbell button unit and the chime units are part of the doorbell system. However, understanding what SysML is doing, this is not quite what you might think as a beginner. Um, beginners will tend to think of this as something like Faberge eggs or Chinese boxes, that you have a thing within inside a thing within inside a thing. And there is some out, out, uh, ask tr truth to, the, to that. But, but really, when we talk about a system like a car, uh, when you talk about an engine, the car has an engine. The car really has the mounting holes for an engine. And the engine may have an oil pump, but it really has a mounting bracket for an oil pump. And when you go to manufacture a car, you've got to go say, all right, I've got the car ready. I need an engine. So you now turn to some other company that manufactures an engine that company makes the block and so on, says, ah, oh, I now need a, uh, a, an oil pump. And they get from another company, they get an oil comp pump, they bolt it into the engine, then they give the finished engine to the car maker who bolts it into the car. And this is what the part relationship is like. Uh, it's really the kind of the mounting bracket for a part. And we think of this in terms of the role that, the, uh, that will be played. So here we see the role in the doorbell button unit, we're gonna say this is the front doorbell. I've certainly had houses in my neighborhood when I was a kid that had buttons and different chimes for uh, the front bell for guests and a different bell for neighborhood kids to see their family's neighborhood kids that was on the back porch. So uh, you may have more than one uh, doorbell button in your doorbell system. And likewise, you may have more than one chime. So we're going to have here, this is the kitchen chime. And so, uh, and uh, we're not gonna show it today, but yes, you absolutely can, can uh, model multiple kinds of uh, chime, multiple instances of chime unit uh, uh, for them. And uh, this is one that there's a role for a kitchen uh, chime unit. And when you construct the doorbell system, you have to construct a, a doorbell button unit and a chime unit and assemble the whole things. And that's kind of the meaning of this, uh, this diagram. So this gives you then the basic structure. And um, oh, and now what we're going to do is what about the humans? Well, we've got this, this thing called an actor. Uh, any, any of our re, uh, listeners who've ever done software use cases are familiar, may be familiar with actors. We're going to call this actor the visitor. And uh, here we notice that the visitor is in the context of the doorbell system, but is not part of the doorbell system. These two things are part of the system. This is not. 
This is just the thing in the context that the doorbell system has to interact with. So there's no, no connection here, but they are in the, in the diagram. And now we see over here, this is uh, what's called the browser, and some places call it a containment tree. Uh, but here we can begin to see these things are shown up, and oh, we've got a visitor in the hardware package. That's probably not really what we want. I mean, it's quite okay, but uh, let's add a package called actors. So now we have a package of actors and we just drag the visitor over there and uh, everything works. But now notice here, this thing gets a notation on this diagram that this is from the actors package. These do not because they're in the same package. Here's the diagrams in the same, same, uh, same package as this. Also, we see over here, here's the doorbell system and notice it's underneath in the browser. We can see the front doorbell unit and the kitchen shine unit now as parts of the system. So that gives us the uh, basics of uh, setting up the structure of the bill, bill of materials for the system. And uh, now we want to think about some requirements for the system. Okay, so uh, we're going to add a package called uh, requirements. Oops. And uh, here in the requirements package, we're going to add a diagram uh, called uh, doorbell system requirements. And the uh, SysML has a diagram for requirements. It's actually almost identical to the block definition diagram, but it provides some uh, additional relationships, which we'll see in a minute. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. And now we've got a requirement stick diagram and uh, we're gonna make some requirements. And here I, in the, uh, in the downloadable examples, I've got a little uh, table of the requirements for our doorbell system. So here we've got a chime tone and we got a chime cycle of, you know, uh, it's gonna ring three times and uh, and when, once you press the button, you're gonna do one chime cycle. And this is a feature I always find annoying. You walk up to someone's house and you press the doorbell button and you don't hear anything because the house is pretty well sound isolated and you can't tell whether that button's working or it notices that you are there or not. So our doorbell system is gonna have a nice function. When you push the button, it's gonna start flashing to let you know that it understood that you Flat, uh, push the button and that it's rung the chime. And so uh, the, the button's going to be uh, bright, to bright, but to no. And when it's done, um, it's going to return to a dim glow. So you can see, find it at night. So we're, we're going to have some, some states here. And we've also numbered the diagrams as you, uh, with, a, with some kind of a nomenclature. This, uh, this is, I recommend, uh, random numbers for requirements gets unmanageable very quickly. So you want to think through a, a numbering plan. So now over here, we're going to go back and we're going to create our first requirement. So we bring a requirement over and uh, here the, uh, and it's also the other thing, if you've ever worked with requirement systems like doors, IBM's door system, they often uh, uh, don't set up to have you have a name for a requirement, but you really don't want this as the name because over here, that's going to become quite unmanageable. So you want to have short names for your requirements as long as well as the text. So here we open this to set up the requirement. And we, the first thing we get is the short name, the chime, chime tone. And uh, we set that in here. There it is. This requirement is for the chime tone. Okay, so well, that's good. We got a requirement for the chime tone, but wait, where's the number and where's the actual text? Uh, so we go over here. And in a previous edition of, uh, of uh, EA, there, this, these two things were there. Recently, they've moved over to the tags uh, tab. So uh, we go over here and we now take the number and we put it in the ID. 
and uh, we can come over and take the text and uh, we put it in memo. So there's the text. We see OK, but it still doesn't uh, show up. Hmm. So it turns out one of the little subtle things you have to know is those things are something that UML calls tags. So you uh, you have to uh, go to the compartments. There's lots of compartments that can be visible, and you got to turn on tags. And now here we have uh, requirements. So there's our requirement. It's got an ID CH1. It's got a name chime tone, and here's the text of the requirement. Uh, there are six uh, six requirements. If you uh, if you've got the ultimate edition, you can should be able to load them directly from a from a uh, a uh, spread the spreadsheet right into the tool. Uh, I'm not going to do all six in this today tonight, but I'm going to do one more because we're going to need it in just a second. So I'm going to do uh, I'm going to do this idle dim glow uh, 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 requirement. So we're going to make another requirement here. And uh, I'm take the title. Idle dim glow. And we're going to go over here to tags. Uh, this one is BTO3. And we're going to go get the text. The, the, uh, the button's going to glow, glow uh, dimly. We're going to come here and uh, set the uh, the compartment so that the tags are visible. And now we've got this second one. Now we notice, well, this is great. So we've got uh, we've got some uh, requirements on a diagram. Why would we do that? We can just keep them in a spreadsheet. It's much easier um, to understand the the usefulness of SysML and diagrams. We have to make another kind of model, another uh, diagram. So we're going to make another one. Um, here, so we're going to add another diagram called uh, idle dim glow details. So now we got another diagram, and now we're going to bring uh, well, we're going to make bring that idle dim glow. Whoops, oops, sorry, idle dim glow. Uh, back on here and we're going to again uh, uh, set the compartment visibility to show the tags. Okay, so now we've got there and now what we're going to do is which thing in the system has to make this so? Well that would be the doorbell button unit. So we're going to drag that onto the diagram and you'll notice here it, it notes that uh, this, is a, this is a visitor from another package and it's the hardware package. And now we get the interesting thing about uh, requirements traceability. This has to satisfy that. And so now we can actually show this on a diagram. So this unit has the responsibility for satisfying that. And in a large system, there will be thousands of requirements and hundreds of, uh, of different components in the system. And uh, it's these diagrams can get well first of all these relationships are really important if you're doing a, a safety critical system they're they're required by every safety regime on, on known to man wants to see your requirements traceability and that you can prove that you know for each component which requirements it has to satisfy so this relationship works but all these others are also useful like uh, we can put a test case in here and say that this verifies a requirement so we might make something like dim glow test. And we might say that this verifies that requirement. So you can construct the relationship and sometimes uh, requirements get kind of complicated. We get we conflicting requirements from different departments and we can refine them or show uh, the two conflicting requirements on a diagram and then show what the final uh, consensus requirement was uh, by these kinds of relationships and then who has to satisfy it. So this is a, this is a, a very uh, important part of SysML of getting 
all the different stakeholders on one page of who needs to do what. And yes, you can do it by spreadsheets or even directly indoors, but those get very hard to read very quickly. And these things can be very, very helpful for, especially for a validation engineer to, to know uh, what things need to, need the tests need to handle. Right? So, okay, so now we've done uh, some requirements. And uh, lastly, we're going to do a, a behavior. So the uh, SysML has three kinds of behavior diagrams. It has an activity diagram, which is uh, basically a flow chart in your conventional thinking. It has a state machine diagram, which can show states. And uh, it has a, uh, uh, a sequence diagram. Sequence diagrams are very helpful for getting a lot of stakeholders on one, one page. Uh, about how the system is going to work. So we're going to make a system diagram, a sequence diagram, to show what happens when the visitor arrives. So now we're going to add another package. We're going to call this behavior. Now, there are many different ways to uh, organize your model. Um, and uh, I've just got one here. The, this, I like to tell pe people when they ask, well, what's the absolute right, right way to organize your, uh, your model structure? And I, I uh, paraphrase uh, uh, Bruce Lee, who is said to have said essentially, good form is what works, when asked about what was the best Kung Fu form. And uh, this is the same thing. Your, your, your structure of your packages has really got to be easy for your particular stakeholders to understand. Um, and some people do it by project phases, some do it by subsystems, some do it by logical versus physical design, lots of different ways. At any rate, I've got a structure here, we're putting the behavior in there. And now we're going to do this correctly. We're gonna add an element called an interaction. And we're gonna call this You can actually create the diagram directly. The tool will let you, but this, uh, this I got some feedback from readers in Japan of my book, that strictly speaking, the standard requires you to create an interaction element and then create the diagram within that. And he's, that reader is right. That is what the standard asks you to do. So we're gonna do it the right way. So now uh, we've, uh, we've got a, an inter something called an interaction. And this is, created a uh, diagram for us. Unfortunately, this has created a UML diagram, not a SysML diagram. So we're going to delete that. And now we have just the interaction and we're going to uh, add a uh, SysML diagram for uh, se sequence. And the main difference is the SysML diagram is gonna have the frame around it with the SysML. So here we have a sequence diagram for an interaction uh, and uh, it's a visitor arrival. So now we get the first element is the visitor. Bring the visitor over here and we notice, okay, the visitor shows up at the top and then this dashed line appears. This dashed line is what's called the lifeline and this we can visualize time starting at the top and flowing to the bottom. And so we're going to show what happens to the different elements uh, as uh, time goes on, time progresses here. So the two elements we're going to be concerned with are the doorbell button unit. And we're going to put that next to the visitor because it's the thing the visitor is actually going to interact with directly with the finger. And then we're going to uh, show the chime unit. Space these out to make some, uh, some uh, space. So the first thing that happens here is visitor walks up and presses the button. So we make a message that flows from here to there. Now we got a message and uh, we're gonna name that. We're gonna say button pressed. Now we're gonna notice though, this little solid triangular arrow has the meaning of a synchronous message, i.e. the visitor would have to stand there 
holding the button until someone came to the door. And we really want, don't want that. We want something more like dropping a, a letter in a mailbox. So we want this to be asynchronous. So we're going to uh, do that. And here in the properties windows, before anything changes, we've got to push the little diskette here, which saves it. And now we notice we've got the, uh, the name here and, uh, and the arrow is turned to an open arrowhead. So once this, uh, this uh, the, the visitor actually presses the button, the next thing that happens is the button lets the chime unit know that a button was pressed. So we do it again. And again, it's asynchronous. Okay, once this, the, the chime unit will begin, uh, well, we'll tell the, uh, the button unit, okay, I got it, start flashing. So uh, that's exactly what we show, we show here. Uh, so uh, we now confirm Time is starting. And asynchronous. And so now the chime is starting. At this point, the button begins to flash. So the button is flashing. And uh, okay. And now uh, the button's flashing. And now a little bit later, the uh, the chime uh, finishes. So we have here, chime ending. And uh, we now do that. And here next we have here, then the last thing that happens is the button become, goes to dim glow state. Okay, so now we have a, um, a scenario and uh, this one's a very simple one. Uh, this is very good uh, and very popular with verification teams to make this kind of thing because it, it pretty much directly sets up your sequence of tests. Um, comment though, I had from, from a young uh, ver uh, software quality engineer from the Netherlands at a conference was, she said, the sequence diagrams were extremely helpful for getting all the stakeholders on one page but they wouldn't compile. And you will notice there are a lot of things you can do here. This is a so-called so sentence fragment. You can put loops in the thing and do all kinds of stuff. And her comment was, and when we added enough detail about like setting up loops within the sequence and stuff so that it would compile, the stakeholders could no longer understand the diagram. So this is the trick with sequence diagrams uh, is you usually, again, they're really good to fairly quickly set up some sample sequences of what might happen. Then that can be very useful for, a, for setting up a test uh, and, and, of course, help, helping people understand the basic idea. But it's very hard and, in fact, diminishing returns to make a sequence diagrams exhaustive. You, you really don't want to even try to do that because you'll end up with something that isn't very useful. The other thing that um, is these messages, these can be uh, eventually uh, tied to operations within the units and, uh, and can be signals, which will cause state transitions from the state machines. So activity diagrams, aka flowcharts, 
sequence diagrams in state machines, when you properly design the system, all can work together uh, to, uh, to really uh, have a nice description, especially for multiple independent uh, things that kind of operate like a system of systems is independently uh, uh, work together about what what's expected about how these all these different somewhat autonomous things are going to play together. So at any rate, uh, this is the end of the quick start tutorial, which you can download. Uh, so a little faster, I'm used to doing this in person with people asking me questions and slowing me down while I'm talking. So this went a little faster than I expected. But the good news is we have a lot of time for questions. So if people have questions, uh, I have plenty of time to, to answer them and I can show you in the tool what, how things work. So I think we can, we can go over to the questions now. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, I thank David on behalf of everyone for making this session a wonderful one. Uh, as we said earlier, uh, now is the time for Q&A and we will be reading out the questions from the chat and David will be answering them. And uh, uh, we can see that uh, there, are, there are no questions asked yet, but uh, we can wait some time for them to ask yep. questions. Yep, okay. we can ask and I can put this back up here. I noticed we have some people who arrived late. So um, again, this is, you know, uh, reviewing here. If you want to work on SysML, you need at least the corporate version of uh, Enterprise Architect. You can download the tutorial we just walked through here, satepress.com. Uh, and this again was the, well, about the, the, that. You can get the whole book on how to do all of SysML both as a Kindle, uh, Kindle's available worldwide and uh, the uh, paperback uh, version's available in the US. I'm working on getting it available worldwide or more, at least more countries. Uh, and questions can come here. I'll leave that up so people, anyone who wants to send a question afterward can. And you can also, as a part of the conference, you can download this here. So you can go here and uh, this little presentation is available on the team uh, just uh, just right here. So uh, that's well, where we can get that. So, you know, I'll be happy to just hang out here for a little while. And uh, so if anyone has a question, um, I'll, I'll just be uh, sitting here and, and wait for anyone who, who's interested to send a question into the chat. Uh, OK, David. Uh, uh, David, uh, there yeah. is a question, question from Long. Okay. Uh, that uh, is requesting that, uh, can you show slide again for SysML tutorial? Oh, uh, where to get it? This one, yeah. And another question from Mortiza. Mm -hmm. uh, what is what system will present which uh, UML doesn't? 
Yes, that's a really good question. The current version of SysML is built on top of UML. And in principle, you can do anything with UML. But uh, SysML um, has uh, basically stereotypes of UML like block that are more oriented towards a wider variety of en engineering. UML is very software-ish, you know, and a block is essentially a, a UML class with uh, just a stereotype name and some behaviors. But the point was uh, to uh, adapt uh, the uh, diagrams. Instead of 22 diagrams, we, the SysML only has nine to be a little simpler uh, and to present especially things like blocks uh, and, and a few others like parametric diagrams are available for uh, kind of doing simple simulations of a, of a system that weren't in UML. So more oriented towards uh, designing, elect, you know, kind of um, mechanical electronic uh, software systems, not just software. Yeah, probably the corresponding piece of information that is who uses SysML. There are a wide variety of users, but basically it tends to be uh, aircraft, defense, automotive, uh, medical devices, um, and trains, both the people who make the trains and people who design the train networks, the very largest construction companies, uh, and uh, and so on, uh, really. Uh, oh, yeah, and of course, ships, not so much, except military ships. And the common denominator of who uses SysML is extremely complex systems that no one person can really just get their head around by themselves. That's one. And the other is they tend to be safety critical because safety critical is where you can no longer just wing it you have to be able to prove that you know absolutely all the requirements for every piece and that they've all been tested. And SysML is very helpful for that. Um, otherwise, smaller systems, ones where, yeah, no one gets hurt if they don't work, people tend to want to just do it uh, kind of in their head and not really write down a lot of documentation. They don't use SysML. So that's that's where SysML gets, gets used, is these big complicated systems with a variety of kinds of things. So that's another difference, UML. UML is only between software engineers, but SysML is between a lot of different people who will be looking at the diagrams, not just software engineers. Okay, David. Uh, there is a question from Rocky. He said, uh, hi, David. Can you briefly demonstrate or reframe to some resources for how requirements could be imported from Excel? I understand that EA Ultimate is required for this. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not set up to do it this evening. Uh, I don't have Ultimate on this machine. I have it on another machine. Uh, but uh, I think we can find that um, probably by Googling it. And basically what it is is the, um, is, uh, the EA Ultimate isn't just that feature. It's generally got a lot of stuff in it uh, to interface with Microsoft Office overall and kind of automatically export diagrams into PowerPoint and uh, construct Word documents, and then also move stuff back and forth to uh, spreadsheets. Okay, David, thank you. And there is another question from Long that uh, with the doorbell example you illustrated, could you yeah. code an actual test to simulate the functions? Example, flash when the button depressed. Would I code a test? Or, well, I'm not sure quite what was meant, but when we uh, when we did the requirements uh, here, uh, we showed this, and yes, this would go off, and 
probably in reality, uh, the um, the test case team would make their own models, maybe a whole model for each test. It kind of depends on what they're doing. You could do it all in one giant model, but what people tend to do, the models can be somewhat modular and you can link between uh, between them. And so uh, when you really do SysML, you tend to make a core model that's the core understanding and then the test team makes some additional model uh, the safety team makes an additional model, and they all link to the common center model. That's the that's how you would do that. But this, yeah, you can um, you can actually generate code to some extent with this tool uh, uh, for the test case. It's possible. You can certainly generate documents, you know, test test plans um, with some effort. They can, they can be made uh, for that. Hope that answers the question. Uh, thanks a lot, David. Uh, uh, anyway, we will post all these questions in Teams as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the audience can uh, uh, view there. <clears throat> yep. Okay, David. So thanks, David. Uh, thanks okay. to everyone for your time and support throughout the session. Hope it is very informative and gives a deeper insight into the topic. Uh, now, David will be available in the MS team to have a detailed discussion and answer more questions. The link to the MS team channel is posted in the chat window for your quick reference. If you have difficulties in connecting to teams, please reach us out in chat window or write us at registration at daglobalsummit.com. Thanks once again, everyone, and looking forward to host you all in another wonderful session shortly. Thanks, David. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye.